toucans, honey guides, jacamars, and puffbirds, barbets, and woodpeckers by W.P. Pycraft. Gaudy in plumage and somewhat ungainly in appearance, it must nevertheless be admitted that the toucans form an exceedingly interesting group of birds. On account of their huge and gaily colored beaks, they have been imagined to be related to the hornbills. But even judging by this character, the two groups may be readily distinguished, for whereas the typical beak of the hornbill is surmounted by a large cask, the beak of the toucan is never so ornamented. The solid appearance of the beak in the toucan, by the way, is as much a fiction as with the hornbill, since the horny sheath is supported not on a core of solid bone, but on a frame of delicate bony filigree work, the spaces being filled by air. The coloration of the plumage, which is somewhat loose in character, as well as the bare skin round the eye and the beak sheath, is most brilliant and displays immense variation amongst the different species. Shy and restless in their habits, toucans travel generally in small flocks amongst the forest trees and mangrove swamps in search of food, which consists mainly of fruit and seeds, varying this diet occasionally with ants and caterpillars. It is to this diet of fruit that the great size of the bill and its peculiar saw-like edges are to be traced. At least this is the opinion of the great traveler naturalist Bates, who had so many opportunities of watching these birds. Flowers and fruit, he writes, on the crowns of the large trees of South American forests grow principally toward the end of slender twigs, which will not bear any considerable weight. All animals, therefore, which feed principally upon fruit, or on insects containing flowers, must, of course, have some means of reaching the ends of the stalks from a distance. Monkeys obtain their food by stretching forth their long arms, and in some instances their tails, to bring the fruit near to their mouths. Hummingbirds are endowed with highly perfected organs of flight, with corresponding muscular development, by which they are enabled to sustain themselves on the wing before blossoms whilst rifling them of their contents and the long bill of the toucan enables it to reach and devour fruit whilst remaining seated, and thus to counterbalance the disadvantage which its heavy body and gluttonous appetite would otherwise give it in the competition with allied groups of birds. Toucans appear to be much esteemed as articles of food, at least during the months of June and July, when these birds get very fat, the flesh being exceedingly sweet and tender. They nest in holes of trees at a great height from the ground and lay white eggs. One of the most remarkable of the group is the curl-crested toucan, from the fact that the feathers on the crown of the head are peculiarly modified to form scroll-like glossy curls, which have been compared to shavings of steel or ebony. Mr. Bates writes, I had an amusing adventure one day with one of these birds. I had shot one from a rather high tree in a dark glen in the forest, and entered the thicket where the bird had fallen to secure my booty. It was only wounded, and on my attempting to seize it, set up a loud scream. In an instant, as if by magic, the shady nook seemed alive with these birds, although there was certainly none visible when I entered the jungle. They descended towards me, hopping from bough to bough, some of them swinging on the loops and cables of woody lianas, and all croaking and fluttering their wings like so many furies. If I had a long stick in my hand, I could have knocked several of them over. After killing the wounded one, I began to prepare for obtaining more specimens and punishing the viragos for their boldness. But the screaming of their companion having ceased, they remounted the trees and before I could reload, every one of them had disappeared. With neither charm of color nor peculiar shape, the small African birds known as honey guides are some of the most remarkable of birds and this on account of a quite unique habit of inducing other animals, not even excepting man, to hunt for them. Sir John Kirk, writing of his habits in the Zambezi district, says, The honey guide is found in forests and often far from water, even during the dry season. On observing a man, it comes fluttering from branch to branch in the neighboring trees, calling attention. If this be responded to, as the natives do by whistling and starting to their feet, the bird will go in a certain direction and remain at a little distance, hopping from one tree to another. On being followed, it goes further, and so it will guide the way to a nest of bees. When this is reached, it flies about, but no longer guides, and then some knowledge is required to discover the nest. 
even when pointed out to within a few trees. I have known this bird, if the man, after taking up the direction for a little, then turns away, come back and offer to point out another nest in a different part. But if it does not know of two nests, it will remain behind. The difficulty is that the bird will point to tame beeves in a bark hive as readily as to those in the forest. This is natural, as the bee is the same, the bark hive, being simply fastened up in a tree and left for the bees to come to. The object the bird has in view is clearly the young bees. It will guide to nests having no honey, and seems equally delighted if the comb containing the grubs is torn out when it is seen pecking at it. An old rumor had it that honey guides occasionally lured men onto spots where lions or other large and dangerous beasts lay hid. No credence whatever is now given to such tales, it being readily understood that the bird's course may by accident pass directly above perils of this kind, without the slightest cognizance of this on the part of the bird. The honey guide, however, presses into its service one of the lower mammals, the radal. The fondness of this animal for bees is well known, and by none better than this little bird, which by pointing out nests to its more powerful companion, earns as a reward the broken bits which remain after the feast. Allies of the somber-colored honey guides are the jacamars and puffbirds. The former are rather handsome birds, though small, having the upper parts of a metallic coppery golden green, and more or less rufous below. Ranging from Mexico to South Brazil, they may usually be found on the outskirts of forests near water, sitting perched on the bare boughs of lofty trees for hours at a time. They feed on moths and other insects, caught on the wing, and brought back and crushed against the bough before swallowing. They lay white eggs in the holes of trees. The puff birds, though closely allied to the foregoing, are more soberly clad. Black, brown, and rufous in hue, they lack the resplendent metallic markings of the jacamars. Their geographical range extends from Guatemala and Honduras to Argentina. Though numerous species and genera are known, the nest and eggs appear to have been discovered in the case of one species only. These were found in a hole in a bank and contained two shining white eggs. The barbets are possibly more closely related to the honey guides than the jacamars and puffbirds. Brilliantly colored and having a plumage exhibiting violent contrasts of red, blue, purple, and yellow on a green ground, sometimes with crests, bare skin round the eye, and brightly colored bills, the barbets are, in spite of a somewhat hairy appearance, exceedingly attractive birds. Forest dwellers, like their allies, they feed upon fruit, seeds, insects, bark, and buds, but so noiseless are they said to be when feeding that their presence is betrayed only by the falling of berries they have accidentally released. It is interesting to note that the geographical range of the barbet is much wider than that of its immediate allies, extending through tropical Asia, Africa, and America. The woodpecker tribe constitutes a large group generally divided into two sections, the woodpeckers and the rhinecks. The former are characterized by their large heads and very powerful bills and long and exceedingly stiff tails. The feet are also peculiar, two toes pointing directly forwards and two backwards. Beak, feet, and tail are all specially adapted to the peculiar habits of these birds, which pass their lives upon trees, climbing the trunks, and searching the interstices of the bark for ants, or drilling holes into the unsound portions of the trunk itself for the purpose of extracting the grubs which feed upon decaying wood. That ants and other small insects form the staple diet of the woodpecker is evident from the extraordinary length of the tongue. This is a long, worm-like structure, capable of being protruded many inches from the beak and covered with a sticky secretion so that, thrust into colonies of ants, it quickly becomes covered with them to be withdrawn immediately into the mouth and cleared again for further action. Woodpeckers are all birds of bright plumage, some particularly so and have a wide geographical distribution, inhabiting all parts of the world save Madagascar, the Australasian region, and Egypt. Three species occur in the British Islands, though they are exceedingly rare in Scotland and Ireland. The green woodpecker is a particularly handsome bird. Grass green is the predominating color of its livery. 
relieved by a light scarlet cap, a golden patch over the lower part of the back, and checkered bars on the wings and quills. Scarcely less beautiful in their way are the greater and lesser spotted woodpeckers. The plumage of these birds has a very rich effect, steely blue-black and white being contrasted with scarlet. The spotted and black woodpeckers are remarkable for a curious drumming sound, so powerful as to be distinctly audible even a mile off. It appears to be caused by hammering vigorously on the bark of some rotten branch, the bird's head moving with amazing rapidity as it beats out this curious tattoo. Three North American species, known as sap suckers, have the curious habit of piercing the boles of trees for the purpose of procuring the sap which flows copiously when the tree is so tapped. Another species of the same region seems to be possessed of a persistent dread of famine, storing up immense quantities of nuts, which it appears never afterwards to use. These nuts are tightly fixed into holes in the bark of trees, and in such numbers that a large pine, 40 or 50 feet high, will present the appearance of being closely studded with brass nails, the heads only being visible. The wrynecks differ from the woodpeckers mainly in that the tail feathers are soft instead of spiny. Although somber, the plumage is yet very beautiful, having a velvety appearance, variegated with pearl gray, powdered or dusted over a general groundwork of nut brown, buff, and gray. Bars and fine lines add still more to the general effect and render description still more difficult. One species is common in England. It is known also as the cuckoo's mate and the snake bird. The former name is given in allusion to the fact that it arrives with a cuckoo, the latter from its strange habit of writhing its head and neck, and also on account of its curious hissing note made when disturbed on its nest. It has the long, worm-like tongue of the woodpecker, but without a barbed tip. The habit of writhing the head and neck often serves the wryneck in good stead. Nesting in a hole in a tree, escape is difficult so soon as the discoverer has come to close quarters. The untried egg collector, for instance, peering down into the nest and seeing nothing distinctly but only a moving head and hearing a hissing sound, imagines the hole to be tenanted by a snake and beats a hasty retreat only to catch a glimpse, a moment later, of the bird hurrying out of its perilous hiding place. Should he, however, discovering the true state of affairs, put down his hand and seize the bird, it will adopt yet other resources. Clinging tightly to its captor's finger, it will ruffle up its feathers, stretch out its neck, and at the same time move it jerkily and stiffly about, and finally, closing its eyes, hang downwards as if dead. Then, before the puzzled captor has had time to realize what has happened, it loosens its hold and takes instant flight. The young are easily, though rarely, tamed and form extremely interesting pets, feeding readily from the hand and affording endless amusement by their remarkable manner of capturing flies and other insects, but they do not appear to live long in confinement. The wryneck is one of the few birds which will persistently go on laying eggs, no matter how many times they may be stolen from the nest. A case is on record where as many as 42 were laid in a single summer by one bird, an exceedingly cruel experiment. The End of Section 15 by Dave Courier